everybody. How's everyone doing today? So good to see everyone. My name is Eric Bucci, and I'm the lead pastor here at Cornerstone Church. Is this your first time joining with us here at the Cornerstone? I want to welcome you, those in line as well. It's an honor that you've chosen to be here today. Can you guys do me a big, big favor? We do this every week to let everyone know how important they are. All the first-time guests here, all those that are watching online, and for yourself. Nice and big and loud. Come on. Let's welcome everybody. All right. We are in a series called It's Complicated, but it doesn't have to be. I don't know about you, but I've had enough of complications, huh? I mean, I don't like complicated things, do you? And so we see a lot of stuff going around in our culture that's extremely complicated, and it does not have to be complicated. And today we're going to talk about part two. We're going to be talking about sex once again, sexual purity, and the complications that happen from sex, uh, from misuse of sex. And so I don't know about you, but I'm tired of every, nearly every week hearing about some politician, some pastor, somebody that I respect, someone that I love falling, going through a divorce uh, because of sexual uh, improprieties or a person that I look up to f losing their position. And you hear it day in, day out, day in, day out. It happens all the time. And you hear it over and over again. It's like, what is going on? And then I am knowing that I'm a human being and these are great men and great women of God. If they fall, how, about, how am I supposed to stand? And so you hear all this, and like, how can we be pure in an unpure culture? How can you and I not have all those complications? Make no mistake, sexual sin will complicate your life like nothing else. Look at all the lies and all the things that take place, and God wants to set us free from that. So today we're going to be talking about that, but before we do that, I just want to mention something to you about something I read this past week and looked into Back in, in New Zealand, there are these caves that are a half a mile deep. And these explorers and these, uh, these journalists went down to take a look at it, and they did a series on it on television. And I saw it on the Internet. Don't look at it right now, please. And what happened, they went down a half a mile deep, and they took their cameras, and they were amazed. They are a half a mile below the, the mouth of the cave, and they're looking at the ceiling, and they see the star field. It's like, what on earth? It was beautiful. It looked like a starry night. And they couldn't believe what it was. And so they looked at it, and they looked at it closer, and what they found were they, these worms, these silkworms, had larva. This larva would glow like a lightning bug, but different. It stayed on. And so they'd have different sequences, and they would turn on different times. And they would have these eight-foot uh, webs look like beads. They go eight feet down. And as they got closer and as they took their camera, they began to notice there was wildlife or actually moths being caught by these webs. And so what happened was the moths saw the light, thought it was the stars. Now, I did not know this. I just read, at doing re I, got, I fell in a rabbit hole with this story, by the way. I spent over an hour and a half reading about this stuff. It's fascinating. But what happened is I didn't know that. Do you know moths know star charts? I had no, the moths use stars to navigate. And so they don't, they're not into astrology, they're smarter than that. But they use the, um, they use the night sky. And so what they have, they see the light and they think they're outside and they think they're going after the right light and they shine and they fly towards it. And as they fl fly towards it, what happens is they get stuck. And all of a sudden they start flapping their wings and they get stuck and they get more stuck. And, and they get kind of encapsulated in this web until... The silkworm larva comes down, opens its mouth, and eats it and kills it. You know, I looked at that, I thought, that's exactly what happens to us in our culture today. There are people who are running after these lights, thinking that it's God. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says the devil is like an angel of what? Light. And so just because it shines, just because it looks good, just because it seems godly does not mean it's God. And the enemy does this, and I, I think in no other way, sexual sin is like that. Now, why am I talking about sex in church? Because sex is constantly being spoken about, indirectly and directly in our culture, constantly. Every nanosecond, it seems, something's being broadcasted on our phones. You can't even look at the news. You can't, all the time, we're being told over and over and over, indulge, give in to your sexual desires. It makes no difference. Be free. We hear this over and over and over. And the more we hate, hear be free, the more drudgery 
misery we see, the more broken homes we see, the more crime we see, the more disease we see, the more mental health issues we see, the more devastation we see over and over and over. And it's like, what are you kidding me? This is not working out very well, is it? And it's like those lights. People are flying towards those lights, an angel of light. And unfortunately, a lot of believers have lost sight of who God is. In fact, I don't know if you've ever been in a movie theater where you go in and, and you walk in, you're like, and you come in a little late, and you're like, I can't see a thing. I'm like, and just to let you know, when you get a little older, it's, it's even worse. <laughs> Anyhow, so you can't see. I mean, my kids see in two seconds. I'm like, 10 minutes later, oh, where are you? So you can't see very well. But then the movie, and then you, you, your eyes act, uh, get accustomed to it. You can see where you're going. You're fine. But then at the end of the movie, you're watching a matinee or something like that, and it's, it's, sh- it's sunny outside. You, you go through the other doors. You open it up, and whoa, and the light comes in, and you're blinded. You have to close your eyes. It's just overwhelmed by the light, and it takes you five to ten minutes. And if you're older, it takes you two hours for your, for your, sun, your, light sight, your eyesight to come back because the light. What happened, you became accustomed to the dark, and now you can see the dark, and you got used to the dark, but when you see the light, it hurts you. This is what's happening in our culture today. We've gotten accustomed to the dark, and we begin to see these false lights, and we begin to fly towards them, and what happens is when we see the light, we will run from the light. We're afraid of the light. It's too painful to look at the light, and we don't want anything to do with the light. Let's stay in darkness. The Bible says in John 3, 16 and 17 and 18, though they knew God, they, they, uh, and, and Romans 1 talks about that, but also in John 3, it said they knew the light, but they didn't want the light because their deeds were in darkness. This is what begins to happen. I'm afraid, everybody, a lot of us have gotten used to the darkness of the culture about us. We binge on I'm not trying to be legalistic here. I'm just telling you the truth. We binge on Netflix MA stuff. MA, adult, 18. Oh, it's okay. I'll look past that. We look at that. We sit there and TikTok. And yeah, you find out how to make a cheesecake one moment. The next moment, you see an adulterous thing on there. And you're like, oh, I'm not going to see that. And say, I can handle it. I can handle it. And you all of a sudden just plant seeds in your mind. And the next thing you know, you hear about people falling. And you're like, and then you can't believe it's happening. And it eventually happens to you. Because we've gotten used to the dark. Now we see these false lights, we fly to the lights, and then we get stuck. See, the enemy's not dumb. He knows how to get us. By the way, he's not very creative. He's been doing the same stuff for 4,000 years. And so how do we deal with these issues today? How do we remain in sexual purity? Now, I'm gonna, just, I'm gonna talk about something next. Now, I don't want you being offended, okay? Can you make me a promise you're not gonna be offended? When I'm ready to share with you, you might be offended, but do not be offended when I'm ready to share. If you wanna stay in sexual purity, this is what you have to do. Keep your clean underwear on. Okay? The last service was a lot more forgiving than you are. <laughs> to remain in sexual purity, keep your clean underwear on. There's a scripture for this. Hang on. What are you talking about? How can you say such a thing? Well, um, right now I am wearing clothes. Aren't you glad? Yeah, I am. And so uh, here's the top, here's the uh, outerwear. But there is something called underwear under it. And uh, I'm not going to demonstrate, but my wife can tell you that I'm wearing underwear. Right, honey? Thank you. So, but you can't see it. Aren't you glad? I am. Okay, but what is underneath? We focus on the outside, but what's on the inside is what God looks at. Jesus told the Pharisees, you are like whitewashed sepulchers, clean on the outside, but dirty on the inside. And so God cares about our inward part. And we're so concerned about the outside. We're concerned about, well, I don't do that. I'm faithful in my marriage. I don't look at this other person. I'm not involved with this kind of talk. I don't do that. So I'm clean. And those people, they're a wreck. I can't believe they live that lifestyle. We sit there. Just because we're not wearing the paraphernalia, we think we're okay. But what's underneath the outerwear? What's the underwear? Captain Underpants. And so I'm going to speed through this, but we've been talking about this. The whole series has been about this. We're going to talk about underwear in a few moments. I'm in a relationship, and it's complicated. Anytime your relationship is complicated, there's sin. Make no mistake about it. And, and the good news is God does not want our relationships to be complicated. They're very simple. Love God and love each other. That's what we're called to do. And the moment it becomes complicated, there's sin involved. Sin complicates your life. God's ways simplify your life. It makes it so much better. I don't like complicated things. I don't like talking to Singapore on the, on the phone for two and a half hours because I can't get my computer to work because it's complicated. How many people can agree with me on that one? 
Do you like calling customer service? Please wait on the line. If you need this, press one. To talk to a real person, press zero. And then you talk to someone, to, okay. But I don't like all that complication, it's frustrating. I want things simple, and God is simple but profound. Sin complicates your life. We've been talking about that the whole time. Jesus makes life extremely simple. Let me give you an example. This happened yesterday. I was in my prayer time here at the church, and I was praying for the services today, and uh, something came up. Often when I pray, things come to my mind that, like, oh, man, that person irritates me. No one in this church, that person irritates me. Oh, man. And all of a sudden, I had some salty language that I was kind of sharing with the Lord when I thought of the person. It wasn't that bad, but it was a little bit salty, right? I'm like, God, this person, I thought I know I shouldn't be thinking that way, but this person drives me crazy because they don't rest. I was going off on them. And God, it's not right what they're doing because, you know, after all, the situation, I'm being righteous in the situation. They're not being, and God's like, knock it off. I'm like, I literally have conversations with God. I'm not crazy. I said, God, what do you mean? Let me ask you a question. If uh, I want you to separate me from the equation. In other words, how this person is treating you, how this person thinks about you. Separate me, because I know you're st- what you're standing for is right. But take me out of the equation. Would you still be upset? I'm like, yes, then it's not about me. It's about you. Get rid of you. And then I'll deal with it. Otherwise, I'm folding my arms. You want to deal with it by yourself? You go right ahead. But you need to let go of this. So I had to let go of it. And so, so God, you know what? This person, you know, it's not about me. It's about you, God. What they're doing is wrong, but I'm so concerned how they think and what they're saying and all this other stuff that it's making me agitated and angry. And it's not about God's will. It's not about God's protection. It's about my own ego that even though it has biblical reasons to, to say the person's wrong, I'm more concerned about me than God. And so I'm like, God, forgive me for that. Lord, this is about you. God, thank you. Now I can help you. It's almost like a police officer who is dealing with somebody and the person does something wrong. And, and they bring correction to that person, but then the person offends the police officer. The police officer forgets about the, the fact that they represent the, the, uh, the law, and they take matters in their own hands. Or for the, and, and by the way, police officers are awesome. We love police officers. They're human beings. How many parents out there? How many your kids frustrate you to no end? And what they're doing is wrong, and you want to correct them. But somehow or another, they've touched you. They got into your head. And now you overreact and you're now you're correcting them not based upon the truth. Now you're correct because you're offended by what they've done to you and what they've said. Now that's never had to anybody in this room except for me. <laughs> well, that's an example of what happened with me and the Lord. Now, what do I say that for? Because my relationship with that person in my mind, and incidentally will be when I see them, is complicated because there's sin. It's about me, not God. The issue that complicates all of our relationships is that we want to be God. This is not my church. The moment I start feeling stressed about this church, it does happen occasionally. I feel like, oh my gosh, it's about me. Wait, 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 wait. This is not my, God, hey, hey. People say, well, Cornerstone is your church. No. (laughs) The moment it's my church, it's I have to fix everything. I don't want to fix everything. This is the Lord's church. I'm here as a uh, overseer by God, but I am not in charge of this church. God is in charge of this church. And when that happens, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. There's still a yoke, there's still a burden. And this is what begins to happen with all types of sin. So I'm just showing you that the moment this becomes my church, then I get complicated about Cornerstone. I get complicated about you. They don't appreciate me. All this trash begins to happen. Complication. So what does sin do? Sin complicates your life. Righteousness simplifies your life. When it's the Lord's church, okay, God, it's still a problem. Don't get me wrong. But God, it's your issue. You gotta deal with it. So I just wanna encourage you with this, okay? This is what the whole series is about. But now we're moving into the sexual area, and it's this. In Thessalonians 4, 3 through 7, God wants us to be pure. He wants to have pure undergarments on. For this is the will of God. You wanna know the will of God? People say, I wanna know God's will. Should I go to college? Should I marry this person? Should I move here? Should I do this? Should I do the other? Well, God gives his, his, his open wills flat out. If we pay attention to the will that's revealed, he'll begin to show us the stuff that's not revealed. 
But if we're not going to take care of the stuff that's revealed, why would he want to give us more responsibility and we have more accountability? If your child can't make its bed and crashes its bicycle, why would you give them a car? St. God's the same way in many ways, okay? For this is the will of God, your sanctification. It means becoming more like God. That you abstain from sexual immorality, and the word sexual is pornea, where we get the word pornography. Sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. Okay? We're being told now, do whatever your body tells you to do. Don't, I, have a pre, I have a genetic predisposition towards this. I cannot help myself. I, I was born that way. And the government tells us all these things and they have all these days and, and they make all these things. Let me ask you a question. What would happen if April 15 comes around and you get a letter from the IRS and then the six months go by and you have not paid your taxes? And the government, the IRS contacts you. I'm sorry, sir. I cannot pay my taxes. I have a predisposition genetically that I just don't pay taxes. I, it's not in my blood. I, I can't do it. I, 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 that's a hate crime if you ask me to, to pay my taxes. I can't help it. I, 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 my family has never paid taxes. It's in my bloodline. Okay, I, I cannot pay my taxes. I cannot do it. it. You're being judgmental. This is to who I am. I have no control over it. Now, how ridiculous would that be? Now, the government would never put up with that, but they put up with all the other stuff. Okay, we make a lot of excuses for things that are flat out. So sexual morality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness. Now, how does that happen? Not in the passion of lust. I must have more like the Gentiles who do not know God that none transgress and wrong his brother. And this is the part that makes no sense. What I do in the privacy of my own bedroom or the privacy of my own internet browsing has nothing to do with you. According to the scripture, that's not true. If I am a believer in Jesus Christ, I give my life to Christ. If I sin, it hurts you. It hurts God. How can you say that? I just said it. That's why I can say it, and it's true. You do not sin in a vacuum. What you do affects other people. And then when I begin to sin, it hurts the community. What happens is if I start sinning and I'm selfish, guess what happens? Our relationship is compromised. Now I can't give to you what I should give to you. Now there's complication in my relationship. You see, everybody, you cannot separate sin from relationship. You cannot do it because the Bible says if you hate your brother whom you do see, you cannot love God who you do not see. That principle boils down to relationships. If you can't obey God, you're going to hurt other people. So what you do in the privacy of your own home affects other people in the kingdom of heaven. Now, I'm not suggesting that our government makes laws about these types of things because I don't want that. But in the kingdom of heaven, it's a whole lot different. Because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you. See, all these things, sexual immorality, transgress. He's an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand. And Solomon warned you, for God has not called us for impurity, but holiness. Holiness is amazing. Holiness is not boring. Holiness is not a white robe with naked babies playing harps in heaven. That's not heaven. That's not holiness. Holiness is wholeness. W-H-O-L-E-N. Whole. I'm whole when I'm holy. When I'm set apart from God and I am holy, what happens is I am now functioning in my design. But when you and I choose not to be holy, we get holes in the wood of our lives like termites. And the next thing you know, your body and your life is like sand. You touch it and it falls apart. So God wants you to be whole in every capacity. So purity is keeping on clean underwear. It's what's on the inside that God cares about. We spend so much time looking at the actions of it. We forget, well, I'm not impure. I don't look at that. I'm not having adultery. I don't look at pornography. I don't do those types of things. I'm fine. Oh, really? Yeah. Then why do you look at that other person? Man, I wish, my, I, wish I could marry someone like that. Why do you look at that person and say what you say? Jesus said, if you have lust in your heart, it's like you're doing it. Just because you don't do the action, you see, you got dirty underwear. You don't have clean underwear. In fact, the Bible talks about this. Uh, it looks like, looks like an old man, doesn't it? He puzzles his pants way up to here. But this is what they wear, the priestly garment. By the way, I could go on and on about this. I've been studying this a little bit. And 
incredible, all the pieces of the priests. Are, by the way, you're a kingdom of priests, and the, New, King, and the uh, New Testament says. So these priestly garments all have meanings behind it, but underneath the outer garment, you think the person's fine. The unseen part is the underwear. And notice how they wear the underwear. Uh, I'll go ahead and show you a scripture for it. You shall, see, it's in the Bible. You shall make them linen undergarments, that's underwear, to cover their naked flesh. They shall reach from the hips to the thighs. In other words, no speedos. <laughs> Can I hear an amen? In Europe, I don't know what they do in Europe, but I'm never gonna do it, okay. I believe in holy attire. They shall reach from the hips to the thighs. Can I hear an amen, guys? Thank you. And they shall be on Aaron and on his sons when they go into the tent of meeting. They have to be holy, not to expose themselves when they're climbing the stairs. They have to be holy on the inside. The part that no one sees is the part that God really cares about. The exterior is a manifestation of the interior. You take care of the interior, the exterior will be fine. You just work on the exterior, you can have a lousy interior. And so God wants us to have this clean interior. Or when they come near the altar to minister in the holy place, lest they bear the guilt and die. This is serious, right? This shall be a statute forever for him and for his offspring. Now, we're not, we don't literally have to wear these garments today, but it represents a holiness in the most intimate place of our life. And think where that holiness is. Covering the loins. Now, this is, don't, don't, don't be offended by this. Why is it that God chose circumcision as a covenant marker for, for mankind? It's the most sensitive area, right? Causes the most trouble. This is the reason why. Now, I didn't make this up. It, it's important. He who sins sexually sins against his own body. We did that last week. We talked about it last week. There's a reason why God talks about these things. Oh, I can't believe he's saying that in church. Really, everybody, come on. We hear it in our culture everywhere. Music, videos, TikToks, and social media. People are talking, and you come there, oh, I can't believe I talk about that in church. Oh, give, knock it off. We're not going to get healthy until we start dealing with truth. We're not going to get healthy until we expose the lies. As I said last week, you're only as healthy as your secrets. And so let's stop having secrets, unless it's Victoria's secrets, and it's okay if you're married. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has what? Clean hands and a what? Pure heart. See, purity matters. Who does not lift up his soul to what is false. Does not lift his soul up to the false light in that cave, the larva. And does not swear deceitfully. Blessed, Jesus said, are the what? Pure in heart. The inward part of you. The part that no one sees, God sees. Now, in 2 Timothy, we're going to spend some time on this for the rest of our time, 2, 2, 2, says this, flee also youthful lust. Notice it doesn't say negotiate. doesn't say, I can't believe they're doing that now. How could they do that in our culture today? I have to investigate and see, oh, what is going on with artificial intelligence? I can't believe they have that. Oh, I can't believe they're doing that. And you're looking at it just to investigate. Yeah, yeah, don't, don't, don't fool anybody. You're you know, looking at Instagram, you see something. Well, 90% of the time, I'm fine. I'm learning how to make cakes, yeah? And then you're looking at someone else's cakes, okay? No. <laughs> I didn't mean that. Yes, you did. All right, let's move on. <laughs> I didn't say that. Okay. Lord, forgive me. Flee youthful us and pursue righteousness. So it just says flee. Joseph, with, Hotifer's, with Potiphar's wife, her name was Hotifer, he did not negotiate. What did he do? He ran. The Bible says run. God's not there for you if you're not going to run away. You need to cut off those things that are bad. Jesus says it in the Sermon on the Mount. He says if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Now we're going to get into that when we go through that series, what that means. But listen, he's basically saying cut off things that cause you to fail. It's not worth it. It will send you to a place you don't want to go. Cut it off. If you struggle with Instagram, get rid of it. If you struggle with TikTok because there's all these cladded, these, these, these cladded people, get rid of it. If you're struggling with your body image and every woman on there looks amazing and you feel like, oh man, I have to keep my mask on. I don't want to take my mask on after COVID because I'm ugly and I don't want anyone to see me and so I'm going to keep my mask on. This is the stuff we're hearing. How dare anyone think that about themselves? You're beautiful. 
Every woman here, you're beautiful. People, I'm, I actually heard that, that some teenagers don't want to take off their mask. How dare the devil say that about our kids? You're beautiful. You're made in God's image. Don't believe a lie. Sad. This is what the enemy does. And so that might be an addiction for you. Knock it off. Get off that. That's all filters anyhow. That's for somebody today. I don't know who, but that's for somebody. Flee useful lusts. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord. Notice that, everybody. We're going to get into that a little bit later. Now, what's so interesting is this. Flee lust and what? Pursue righteousness. So, and rather than try not to do all these wrong things, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't look at this, I can't look at the internet, I can't watch movies, I can't talk to this person, I, I go to the mall, I can't look here, I can't look there, I'll look at the ceiling like this and use my GPS. <laughs> Siri will get me through the mall. No! Sometimes we're going to have to see stuff, you're going to have to bounce your eyes, that's another topic. But the point is this, flee, youthful lust. Now how do you get free, everybody? How about this huge list you got to do? Well, this here's how you get free. When Samuel sinned, I mean, so I'm sorry, Samuel, Saul sinned, the first king of Israel. This is very telling. Check this out. This is God speaking to Samuel, who's the one that appointed Saul to be the first king. He said this, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from, what? Following me. All his sin happened when he stopped following God. What Jesus is asking us to do is not to worry about this huge list. You follow Jesus. You go after God. You love God. And by the way, this is the good news. You're designed by God for God. And when you love God, you'll love him more. The closer you get to God, the more you love him. The more free you are. The more whole you are. Listen, you may not think so, but you're made, created for God, and it comes in the right place. So following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry. So what happened was Saul stopped following God. The moment you stop following God is the moment you start falling into sin. We have to keep our eyes on God. Now, purity is keeping on clean underwear. I'm going to ask my dear friend Allie to make his way up and fear God by loving him. Now, the Bible says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Now, I don't have the, I don't have the audacity. This is Allie. He's awesome. Say hi, Allie. Hi, Allie. <laughs> small groups, big impact. Be part of small groups, okay? Allie's a great guy. Now, Matt, Allie, I, you're, I really appreciate you. You're a dear friend of mine. I, I, I can't tell you how much I, I like you. <laughs> now, I didn't do it in real life because he beat me up. <laughs> He's a lot bigger and stronger than I am. Okay, you don't mess with Iranians. <laughs> so imagine you do that. So I say, hey, man, I, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do that. I have, a pre, I have a genetic predisposition to slap people. I can't help myself. But I really appreciate you, okay? Oh, I'm sorry. I, 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 I won't do it again. You and I are best friends. Will you forgive me, Allie, please? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> now, imagine I would do that. We do that with Jesus. Jesus, I love you but I'm only human. Pop. We slap Jesus. Now, this is just so interesting. People treat their dogs better than they treat God. I know dog is God backwards. But seriously, people will feed their dogs and do all these great, and they'll sleep with their dogs, they'll talk to their dogs, and nothing wrong with dogs. But if you treat your dog better than God, that's a problem. Now think for a moment. If someone came to your house, you have a dog, and someone comes to your house and starts kicking your dog, what are you going to do? If someone starts feeding your dog poison, what are you going to do? Right? So if you love your dog, you're not going to beat your dog. If you love God, you're not going to beat God. Yeah, but imagine this. I, I make a mistake, and I keep slapping God's face. Imagine I'm sleeping uh, Ali's face, and I go, ow! And I'm like, ow, my arm, my hand hurts. Oh, my hand, I'm sorry, God. God, my hand hurts from slapping you. Oh, God, I'm so sorry. I hurt myself. God doesn't want to see me hurt. He wants to have me whole. He wants me happy and live in prosperity. Oh, God, I hurt myself by slapping your face. How ridiculous that would be. When you sin, you hurt God. Why? Because God loves you un unbelievably. You love your dog. And if your dog is doing something silly, how about your kids? You love your kids. 
And if your kids are doing something that hurts themselves, what are you gonna do? God loves you, everybody. And when we say, I'm gonna do it my way, and you're slapping God, you're slapping the creator of all the universe. Listen, I just showed you, I wouldn't dare do that to a friend of mine. I wouldn't do that for a dog. But why do we do it to God? Just saying. You know, there's a dog park over there. By the way, do not bring your dog to a dog park. I hear nothing but bad reports from dog parks. If you want your dog to get sick or get in a fight, go to a dog park. If you want to have, live a peaceful life, don't go to a dog park. You tell people at that dog park, you need to go to Cornerstone and stop being in a dog park. Okay. <laughs> you can't love God and keep your sin. You can't. I can't help myself. I just can't. We're being told by our culture today that you cannot help yourself. It's just the way you are. I just told you what would happen if you told the government, I can't help, I can't pay my taxes. I have a pre I have a distribution where I cannot pay my taxes. In fact, we should have a tax-free month. I'm all for that, by the way, and we should have flags about it. We're gonna celebrate those people who cannot pay their taxes. How ridiculous that is. I can't help myself. Really, you know what the Bible says? No temptation has overtaken you but what is common as man. And God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted more than you're able, but with each temptation, he'll provide an avenue escape that you'll be able to stand under it. The problem is we don't take the avenue of escape. Listen, everybody, we need to start taking responsibility for our sin. I sinned, and I don't have to sin. I, I cannot help myself. Yes, you can. Sure, you can help yourself. I had a friend in the church. He says, my dad was an alcoholic. He used to drive me crazy. He said he could not help putting the bottle in his face. Well, really? He can control it to a certain degree. How can you say that, Pastor? I'll tell you, if you believe that, you, that God is less powerful than your sin, then your sin's going to beat you. But the Bible's true. The Bible says the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead shall raise you up as well. The Bible says that no temptation is overtaking what's common to man. You need to start believing the scriptures and not what the culture says. Amen. Hello? Sin is sin. Stop making excuses. You cannot be willing, you cannot change until you admit you've got a problem. Isn't it ironic? I just find it ironic that the government's all about this, but you tell them, I can't pay my taxes because I, pre I have a genetic predisposition. It's who I am. It's ridiculous, right? So think about it for a moment. You cannot love God and keep your sin. Well, what are you supposed to do But I'm so glad you asked. In Galatians 5.13, it says this. For you are called to freedom. Brothers, only do not set your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Do you notice? Hello, everybody. Can you, can you see that when you are serving God and loving God and serve each other, you get over your sin faster? When you live by yourself in your sin and you don't deal with situations, you get a lousy marriage or you have a situation and you're struggling with your health, you're struggling with um, unforgiveness, whatever it could be, this, you can change it through relationship, through each other. You cannot get away from that, everybody. And Galatians 5.13 says this, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You want to get free of sin, start loving your neighbor as yourself. Think about it for a moment. When you get married, would you want, if you're getting married, would you want your spouse to cheat on you? What kind of love would that be? Would you want someone to treat your daughter like you're treating that person? Of course not. Would I want to do that to somebody? No. I want to love this person as I want to be loved. I want to be treated that way. Would I want to treat that girl? I want to be able to say, and by the way, I just want to say I made out with her so I can tell my friends. Is that how you want someone to treat your sister? Yeah, but we didn't have sex. Yeah, really, but you used her. Is that how you want someone to treat your sister or your brother? We need to look at it that way. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That stops a lot of problems, everybody. I'm gonna swindle this person and not tell them that this product was not gonna work like I said it was gonna work. Who are you hurting? That person. If you love that person, would you do that to yourself? No, of course not. Can you see that treating each other well is a safeguard against sin? Loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself is a safeguard against all types of sin, including sexual sin. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you're not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. It takes a while. It takes a while, everybody. Okay. You cannot love God and keep your sin. Or do you not know? Now, this is very serious, okay, everybody? I just want to let everyone know. God loves everybody. This is Scripture. And as long as I'm living, I'm going to read and believe Scripture. 
And this is what it says. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom? He's talking about us here too. Of God. Do not be deceived. Okay, well, God's all about God, loves to love me. Yeah, God forgives you. Yes, I agree with you. But you keep slapping God in the face. You see what happens. Neither the sexually immoral, that, nor the idolaters who worship things and not people, or worship things and people but not God, nor adulterers. I had an affair. You had an affair? No, you committed adultery. It's called what it is. Nor adulterers. And by the way, there's forgiveness for those that have committed adultery. It's not the unpardonable sin. You may have a right to divorce someone, but you also have a right to forgive them. God, I believe God's a God of new beginnings. That's beside the point. But nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, people that cause all kinds of trouble and disunity, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. I think all of us fit into that list someplace. We're not gonna inherit. You don't make excuses for sin. You have to get rid of sin. Sin is a toxin that will destroy you. And such were some of you. But, here's the good news. You were washed. You were sanctified, cleaned. You were justified. That means you were justified before God. Just if I've never sinned of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You see, everybody, it doesn't make a difference what you've done. What Jesus has done on the cross is enough. You don't have to live with guilt and condemnation. It doesn't make a difference what you did. What Jesus did is enough. Now, purity is keeping on clean underwear. Fear God by loving him. You see that, everybody? Love God, and you're gonna do the right thing in loving each other. Control the eye and the ear gate. Okay, we have to watch out where we're looking. All right, now one of the things that's so interesting about controlling, you know that guys primarily, uh, they struggle with lust through their eyes? The Song of Solomon talks about it all the place. It's talking about, oh, she's so beautiful. He goes on and on about how beautiful you are. I'm gonna climb the mountains and take the fruit. And he goes on and on about that. Don't read it right now, please. But he says a couple of things. He says, he says to his wife, he says to his lover, oh, your teeth are like that white as a sheep's teeth. He says, your hair is like a flock of goats. Now, back then, that worked. I don't recommend that now. But back then, that was a compliment. Her nose is like a tower. No, you're, okay. He goes on and on. So all of it's about how she looks. Then the woman talks. Oh, when I hear your voice. Guys don't care about the voice unless they're nagging, okay? He don't, he don't care. So generally speaking, guys look at things. And that's why pornography, let's just be honest here, everybody, I'm sorry, but uh, statistics have shown quite clearly that 80% of the population looks at pornography at least once a month, including Christians. Oh, I can't believe it's something true. Well, it's everywhere, okay? And this is the problem with that. So you have that. Then you have women, and they're having problems with pornography too, but it's a little bit different. They like a lot of the ear stuff. Oh, you're so, you're so beautiful. Look at gorgeous you. Boy, your husband is a lucky, oh, your boyfriend's really lucky to have you. Woo. Boy, if I had a wife like you, I tell you what, I would do. I, 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 I would take you out. He didn't treat you that way. No, he doesn't. Well, I tell you what, uh, let's pray for each other's marriage. Mm -hmm. Okay, all this, oh, he's so, he's so, he listens to me. He understands me. He's one, he doesn't care about one thing. He cares about one thing and one thing only. If a man's sweet talking you, don't believe it. Especially if it's a wrong relationship. Now, if he's sweet talking you and he's married, he's, He's a good guy like me, okay? But seriously, the women like to hear stuff. Oh, he, he says it. Okay, whatever, okay. But this is something very interesting that I read. You think about David, King David. He saw Bathsheba on top of the roof, King David. And Bathsheba was taking a bath. That's why they call her Bathsheba. No, I'm just kidding. And he sees her. He says, I must have her. He sees her. Okay, he looks at her. You can't control the women you see. If you go to the mall, you go to the store, and you see these women, or see these guys wearing these things, okay, you can't stop seeing it, but you can stop from turning your head. As Martin Luther, the church reformer said, the 1500s, he said, I cannot stop a bird from flying over my head, but I can stop it from making a nest in my hair. So it's the second and third look, it's the thinking about it. But this is what begins to happen during pornography and sexual encounters, okay? 
Uh, when you finish the sex action, do I need to go into detail? No, I do not. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Catherine Wu, a PhD from Harvard, said this, that there are, three, um, there are three chemicals released in your mind during sexual activity that bond you like that butterfly going towards that light and hitting that web. It bonds you. I'm going to start to say it right. Uh, Neuroporvin, dopamine, and oxytocin. I said oxycotton last service. People laughed. <laughs> it's about as strong as oxycotton, they say. So these three are released, and what it does, according to the article, and I might make this is a non-Christian article, says the person bonds with what they see and hear in the receptors. So if you're looking at pornography on your phone or your uh, whatever, you are bonding with that image, and when you bond with that image, the image of your wife gets looser, and you can't have intimacy anymore. So how do you get free from it? I'm so glad you asked. You can get free from it. You can get free from it. But understand it's a problem. You don't make excuses. Even people that are not believers say it's bad for your sex life. It's horrible for your sex life. And you're single. Well, I know, but I can't help myself. I understand that it's difficult. I get that. We're not going to be able to solve the issue right now. But why do you want to bond with an inanimate person that's not even real? All you're going to do is ruin your opportunity to bond with your, with your wife or your husband one day. So what pornography does, it invites a demonic presence. I'm not suggesting they're all, but it does invite that aspect. I could go on about this. We will probably in a spiritual warfare series in the future, but this one begins to happen. So women are involved with the ear gate. So how do you get free of these things? Well, let me just say something. Bible says, for those of you who are married, you need to drink deeply of your own love. And you need to bond with your spouse. And so it's important that you look at your spouse, that you see her or see him in his eyes. And that when you get together, look at that person. Don't think of another person. Look at that person. Say, I love you. Talk to each other. And every time you get together and you consummate that marriage, what you're doing is you're gluing yourself to your spouse. That is the, how can you say that? That's the appropriate way to express God's gift of sexual contact, of intimacy. It's a beautiful bringing together. Why do you think my parents can love each other so much? Because they love each other more now than they ever have. Why do I love my wife more than I ever have? I, I have less temptation than I ever had in my life. And then when I was a kid, it's like, oh, now thank God it's not like a tennis match anymore. The more I bond, the more I love my wife, the more I, I give my life to her and love God, the more I love her. And then the intimacy gets greater and greater. And it's so much better than that false light of that worm with the larva that you're flying towards and you get stuck. Why go for that when you can have true light? That's what God would have for us. Now, there's more we could say here. Uh, I read this yesterday in my one year through the Bible. It said he set his turban on his head and the turban in front, and the golden plate. It said, holy to the Lord. The priest would not only wear holy underwear, he would put a headband on a gold that would hold the headdress. They would have blue cord from here to here. And it said, you know what it said from ear to ear? It said, holy unto the Lord. We're a kingdom of priests, ladies. That gold band should be over your ears. What are you listening to? What are you listening to? What is people saying about this and the other? Men and women hearing Primarily women deal with hearing ear gate more than men do. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. And so what are you, what are you looking at? Holding on to the Lord. You ever notice when you think, you feel, you feel like the pressure here? When I'm thinking and stuff like that, I feel like a, I feel right in my frontal lobes. I feel like it's, it's moving around. It's moving. Isn't it interesting? We find out this, this is a part of the thinking part of the brain. Isn't it interesting that the goal goes right there? Holding on to the Lord. So what do you think about? What you listen to? Make it holy unto the Lord. Amen? And that's what we're called to do. There's the, there's the crown, there's the head dress that happens. Okay, so we talked about this already. We need to end, end it here, okay? All right. Flee also you for lust, but pursue righteousness. Faith, love, peace with those. Now look at this for a moment here. We need to be with godly people. Not only do purity is keeping on clean underwear, okay, what your inner part is, Fear God by loving him. Don't be slapping God in the face. Control the eye and the ear gate and be with godly people. Now check this out, same verse, same verse. 
flee sexual, flee also youthful lust. We talked about running, fleeing. We talked about pursuing God, right? Pursue righteousness, follow after that, and all the laws will take care of themselves. Uh, faith, love, and peace, and check this out. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, all by yourself, and just you and Jesus alone, and you're gonna be great. It doesn't say that. What does it say? Faith, love, peace with those. Who are those? People, other people, with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. We need each other in the body of Christ. The Bible says in 1 John, it says, I confess your sins. He's faithful to forgive you of your sins. He'll forgive you of your sins. But the Bible says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you will be healed. God forgives your sin. The body heals itself. Are you connected to the body or are you all by yourself? Now, we need to be real. I don't want to just come to church and play games. Do you? Let's be a community of people that go after God and live the best life God has for us, which is loving him and making him known to other people. I want to encourage you. We're going to have a small group. I can do it because I'm here. But look at this. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Influence. You know what influence? You hear the word flu? You know what flu is, right? You catch, we've been going on through this the last two years, everybody. Okay, flu, you catch something. People are communicable. Their actions will affect you. So hang out with people that are doing the right thing and it will get on you. Jimmy Evans, which is some of the sermons based upon his book, Marriage on the Rock, highly recommend it. Marriage on the Rock, Jimmy Evans. He says this, divorce is a communicable disease. So you have friends that are going through divorces, chances are your, your statistics of you having one go way up. If you can't influence someone, it makes, a, it makes a difference who you're hanging out with. So get it right to the right people. Of course, we go out there and touch other people, but I'm talking about you need God and we need each other. So God doesn't want it to be complicated. I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment. Father, I just thank you today, Lord, all of us in this room and those of us watching online. Lord, we all got stuff. But Father, I thank you that you love us so much. You're not against us having fun. You want us to have life and life more abundantly. And Lord, forgive us for being like those moths that are flying towards a false light only to be stuck and to lose everything. We know that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of you is eternal life. And so Father, I pray right now you bring courage upon people. Lord, that we would turn away from our sins, that we start turning on the light that we'd find people we could share our burdens with, that we could pray for each other. Father, I pray that pornography addictions would be broken in this place. Adultery would be broken in this place. Lust would be broken in this place. Bad body image would be broken in this place. And Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that uh, the spirit of pornography would be broken. The spirit of sexual dysfunction would be broken in this place. We pray for healthy sexuality, Lord God. We pray for the young people, Lord, to make good choices. That you're not, a, you're not a God that condemns, you're a God that heals. And that you love us so much. And we thank you for that today. Father, I pray this would be a, a holy place. A place of healing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In a few moments, we're going to pray for you to give your life to Christ. But I want to invite you. I don't normally do this, but I just believe that this season, I need to make, open an invitation. We've opened our small group to become a larger group. We're having something called Freedom Group. I encourage every believer who has not been through it to go through it. Powerful. We had such a powerful time the last time we went through it, this last, last quarter. I think every believer should go through it. What it's about, it's about finding who you are in Christ, getting rid of lies, and transporting yourself in truth, and walking in the truth of God. I think all of us will benefit from it. It's going to be Sunday nights. Next Sunday it starts at 6 to 7.30. We'll be very careful with the time. We'll be done by 7.30. If you want to hang out and talk, you can, but we're going to be done. And if we're going to open it up, if we need to find other avenues, we'll do it. But I just believe we want to, I'm really taking this very seriously. I've been praying about this. I believe this is the next step for our church. We got to get free. No matter where you are, all of us can become freer. Amen? Hey, before we leave here today, two things. I want to give you an opportunity to give your life to Christ. You've not done it. Today's a day of salvation. And, uh, and so 
Jesus died on the cross for us, everybody. You don't have to die. He's died for us. He breaks the power of sin in our lives. But you've got to be willing to step down from being in charge of your life. Believe he rose again from the dead and he died on the cross. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. I'm going to give you an opportunity for a new day. And so maybe some of you'd say, Pastor, I used to walk with God, but I've, and I walked away. I'm doing my own thing. Or, frankly, I've never really given my life to Christ. But today, I want to be bold. And I want to make a stand and say, from this day forward, with God's help. So I'm going to pray a prayer in a few moments, just so I better know how to pray. Could you just mind raising your hand nice and tall? I can see, I, if maybe you want to give your life to Christ for the very first time or renew your commitment. Anyone be bold enough? Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone on the line? Okay, let's pray this prayer in your heart to the Lord. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died on the cross for me. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And I choose to follow you from this day forward. Thank you that I am now your child. Thank you that I am now your responsibility in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we believe you became born again. In the front pocket of your seat, there's a card you can sign. I made a decision today. You can go also get your phone and you can text. But we won't give you endless text, by the way, just to let you know. We're not going to give you endless text if you sign up for this. You can text BELIEVE to 860-499-4888. And we'll help you with the next steps. We'll have a prayer team up here front. We'll have people at the, uh, the information desk to give you a Bible. We would love to help you with your next steps. Finally, there are four different ways you can give. There are boxes in the back. Um, and so there are four ways you can give. Text Cornerstone Church at 833 245 5608. You can download our Push Pay app on our website. Go to our website. And let me just challenge you with something. I've I've been doing this all my life. I've been tithing 10% of everything I have to the local storehouse. That's your church. And I've been giving above the tithe. And God has more than met my needs and the needs of my family. I'm telling you, when you make it about God's house and God, when you make it God's money, he'll take care of you. If you make it your money, good luck. You're by yourself. I'm telling you, it works not to be greedy, but to be free in Jesus' name. So Father, bless this offering today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me just, if you all stand, I'm going to give you a benediction today. You want to raise your hands as an act of, of, of receiving. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless, with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you.